Can everybody hear me in the back? Good. I get, I get a thumbs up. That's good. Uh, so it's great to be back to PMI Tulsa. Uh, as Zach mentioned, we celebrated our one-year anniversary. So um, as you can see kind of from my bio, I was part of the board for five years. I did have to take a little bit of time off last year to help build Arrowhead, so I'm certainly pleased to be back here and see such, uh, so many familiar faces. I hesitate to say old faces, but familiar faces, and so many new ones. So thank you for coming out. Do want to talk about strategic thinking. It is near and dear to my heart. And I chose the title for the presentation about seeing the forest from the trees because I really think it applies, that adage applies to strategic thinking, and that we always tend to find ourselves heads down and not able to look up and see the big picture. So before we get into the big picture of strategic thinking, I want to see where your focus is. Are you heads down? We've got a little bit of a video exercise, if this will play. Pay attention. This is a test. Try to count the number of footballs, like this one, as they fly across the screen. You have 10 seconds. Ready? Got them? Okay, so first of all, how many people counted all 27? How many people legitimately realized you didn't have to count the footballs? How many people have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, so this should clear that up. So doesn't that happen to us in the real world? We're so heads down with the day in and day out activities that we don't realize valuable information that could be a very uh, good use to us. So here's what I want to do. So that was kind of an individual activity. I've got one more little activity that I want us to do as a group. It's Friday, we should be excited. I'm going to put something up on the screen. I want us to boisterously yell out what you see on the screen. Okay, can you do that for me? And I'm going to be looking at everybody's faces to see at least if your lips are moving. Okay, here we go. Read what you see on the screen. One more time. Okay, hard to tell how many of you missed the two thes. Okay, do we see it now? New York in the the spring. Okay, this is an example of in a inattentive blindness. It's not actually a medical condition that you can diagnose yourself on WebMD, okay? But what it's saying is, is that sometimes we're moving too fast to actually stop and smell the roses or actually see what's going on around us. And so I think this is really kind of tease us up for the rest of the presentation. We're going to talk about the things that strategic thinking is, the things that are blocking us from being better strategic thinkers, and I'm going to give you a case study at the end of a company that has turned themselves around through strategic thinking. So, why do we need strategic thinking from a company perspective? Well, most of the time in organizations, we have that old scenario where the fox is guarding the hen house, where decisions end up getting initiated and enforced and even thought up by the same person. It's generally at the executive level. But when that happens, we see financial detriment to the organizations. Now, if only they would allow everybody else within the company to be part of the decision-making process and apply strategic thinking, we not only see the speed of our projects accelerate, but we see much better financial gains. Unfortunately, when we start looking to those people that we would like to be better strategic thinkers, when they start doing self-study or self-surveys, they don't rate very well on the uh, competencies needed to be better strategic thinkers. So yes, we're going to show you how to be better at strategic thinking, but I'd like to ask you, now going through, okay. I'd like to ask you why, as project managers, would we need to be strategic thinkers? What's in it for us as strategic thinkers as in the PM field? We made eye contact. Give me an answer. In the back, behind Linda. I, would say hi to Linda. I know, but, <laughs> but now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble. So you're on, on point. As a PM, why would we need to be a strategic thinker?
Okay, so it's in your job description? Ah, how many people actually have a job description that says you must be a strategic thinker? I applaud you if you do. I don't see a whole lot of hands. Okay, I think it's something that we should do because that's what's going to uh, allow us to change the culture, is to allow us to grow and come, with up, come up with new innovations, new value. So anybody else? Yes, sir. Why would we need to be strategic in our thinking? It causes you to look forward to what you're trying to accomplish and uh, marshal your, uh, your resources and also understand what you might have to go and get there. Okay, I like that. So the looking forward is key. So the projects that we have go into the future, right? There's a lot of things that influence the success of those, those projects. So being able to think forward is going to aid us. How about somebody on this side of the room? We've given you plenty of time. Why should we be strategic thinkers as project managers? Okay, so I liked how you said unique. So just like project management is the building of unique, temporary endeavors to build unique product services or results, strategic thinking has a uniqueness to it too. All right, and pulling people together is a role from a human resources or stakeholder management perspective. So let's kind of talk through some other things that, from a definition standpoint, what strategic thinking is and what it isn't. So how many people think strategic thinking is problem solving? Okay, to, to an extent. So problem solving, though, is more reactive. It's very much, let's get in the triage uh, mode. Let's mop up the puddle that we see on the floor. All right, it's the firefighting that we do day in and day out. How many of us are having to put out fires on a daily basis? Okay, companies typically applaud those people that put out the fires, but do we ever applaud the people that kept the fires from starting? That's where the strategic thinking comes in. Strategic thinking is going to be more proactive. We're looking to the future. We can use problem solving for strategic thinking, but it has to be to solve future problems, not to solve the present problem. All right? How about strategic planning versus strategic thinking? How many people are involved in their company's strategic planning events or exercises? Few people raising their hand. But for the most part, it's what? It's the executives. It's the ivory tower folks, the people that go off on the retreats, do a little bit of golf, do a little bit of drinking maybe, come back with a strategic plan. All right, well, the strategic plan is generally a once a year activity. It focuses on the year at hand or maybe two or three years into the future, but it's focused on the what, what we're trying to accomplish, goals, objectives, et cetera, which is totally fine and totally great, but strategic thinking allows us the how. How are we going to do it? It's more of a day in, day out mindset that the whole organization and the whole company can embrace. So it's versus just a handful of people to the whole organization. So it is the yin to the yang. They are both important, just like problem solving is important too. But I'm trying to show you the distinct, subtle differences. How about creative thinking versus strategic thinking? So to me, these are very similar in the sense, though, that creative thinking can help when we are trying to problem solve. The best risk register that we have for our mitigation strategies, if we don't have the tools to be able to implement those on the fly, having creative thinking is going to help us kind of solve those situations. So creative thinking helps for problem solving. It can help us as we try to figure out how to accomplish the things in the strategic plan. So it is a good complement to strategic thinking, but they can't be done hand in hand. The other issue that we see with strategic, I'm sorry, with creative thinking is that it requires an immense amount of soak time. Okay, how many people are uh, multitaskers? Good multitaskers? Okay. So we're following under the old, uh, the rule of, hey, let's do more with less. We got to keep doing things uh, because we get bored, so we try to do other activities. We can't focus, and this is where focus is actually needed, we need to be able to focus and have that soak time to unleash and unlock the creative pieces of our brain. So my question is, how are we making time or are we making time to be creative? And so I want to show you a video of some of the most creative people that we know collectively. Chris, can I? We're pausing? Please? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so queuing up uh, creativity and are we spending time to do it? So you may have seen on my bio, uh, creator of project management for youth. Uh, that's near and dear to my heart. It's, it's teaching project management to middle school and high school students, preparing today's students for tomorrow's challenges. We've done that exercise numerous times and it's very rewarding to see what kind of results we get. Uh, we thought about giving you that exercise, but we didn't really have 10 minutes to build into that. So I did a droodle. Anybody heard of a droodle? It's that thing on your table that 90% of you didn't fill out, which is okay. For those 10% that did fill out the piece of paper, um, can you hold it up or tell us maybe what you filled out? And for those that feel gypped that you didn't get to play at home, I'm going to throw the droodle up there. The intent of the droodle, and this is, you're going to have like the 10 seconds versus the 10 minutes. Look at the image and what creatively can you make out of that image in your mind's eye? Somebody shout out what you see. A car, okay. A pop-up camp for us? Okay, a what? A Teletubby. A Teletubby. <laughs> Which one? Winky, Dinky, Pinky, or, or are those the ghosts from uh, Pac-Man? Anybody else? What do we see here? The Iron Giant. The Iron Giant. Okay. A what? A martini. Oh, a martini. Yeah, upside down with two olives and a twist, or are you saying it the other way? <laughs> either way. Either way, 10 seconds, you guys are shouting out some answers. Imagine if you had 10 minutes, how creative we could get, right? So I liked how that other video ended. It said that it's not uh, unlocked through the pressure of time. Most of us, at least during our workday, feel the stress and pressure that's being placed upon us. But if we can't be creative, we can't be strategic. So you're going to have to carve out time to be able to, and maybe I, I had several people say, hey, I'm an engineer, I'm not creative. Eh, not necessarily, maybe, we, maybe. But whatever the case may be, find that time, find the soak time to unleash, unlock the brain so that we can be creative, so that it can aid us in our overall development for strategic thinking. So we talked through some things that strategic thinking was and what it was not, and so there's numerous definitions out in the workplace, but we're going to use this definition for strategic thinking for the rest of the presentation. It's that finding and developing of unique, as that gentleman shared with us earlier, unique opportunities to create value by rigorously challenging conventional thinking. Can't do it the way it's always been done before. Okay, we gotta break the mold. So, now that we know what strategic thinking is, let me ask the question. How many people believe strategic thinkers are born versus made? How many people think they're born? By lack of raising your hand for the most part, we would then say that strategic thinkers can be made, right? So let me pose this question to you. Do you think it's easier 
and we have a good representation of, of the different generations, do you think it's easier for a certain generation, the boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials, to be better at strategic thinking than another generation? I hear yeses. Does anybody want to say what they think, who the best strategic thinkers are? Go ahead. No, uh, distraction. I think this, the generation coming up is distracted by too many things. And it just seemed to me, I have two teenage daughters, they don't take the time to think strategically. Okay, so you're placing your vote on millennials not being the best strategic thinkers. I can see it both ways, right? Okay. The experienced person, if they can learn from their experiences, and the younger person not feeling boxed in by, the, by not keeping open the years. Have you been looking at my slides ahead of time? No, that's, that's very true. So but before we get to that, I want to show you another video. I love videos, as you guys know. I want to show you a video and it shows the different generations trying to solve a strategic thinking problem. I want you to venture a guess before they tell you who won, who you think, and then we'll get into the why, okay? Uh-oh, is that my wife calling? Do we know? Take a look at these three light bulbs. Each one is controlled by a different one of these switches. All you have to do is figure out which switch corresponds with which bulb. We're not supposed to try it at home. Then you only get one shot to go down the hall and label the bulbs correctly. How would you figure out this problem? The truth is, you should be able to figure it out just as easily in your couch as if you were in this room. And while you think it over, you brought in some volunteers. Four are in their early 20s, and four are 45 and older. We let them duke it out head to head. Who do you think will have more success in duking it out? All right, so a good introduction, good introduction of 
crystallized intelligence versus fluid intelligence, and they explained what those two were, but looking for some feedback, how could that also be a detriment to your ability to think strategically? Sears. Say that again? Sears. We'll need a little bit more info than that. So they were the original catalog company. Sears Roebuck, well, yep. Yeah. Right, similar to Kodak when they uh, had their issues, Blockbuster. There's lots of, lots of stories. So you're saying, though, sometimes the people that are the most experienced kind of rest on their laurels and, and don't try to think strategically? Or? It's the this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we've always done it. We've been successful at it. Yeah, but even Will Rogers said, even if we're on the right track, we'll get run over if we just stay there. Right? So we have to be challenging ourselves. But if we have the same people, and Sears and Roebuck was an old family company, and everybody kind of grew up in that, and a lot of times they didn't bring in new folks, new ideas, and that, that becomes detrimental to a company's success. Okay, but what about fluid intelligence? I mean, we have millennials. How many people are millennials in the room? Just that? Okay. We got a few. We need a definition? Well, okay, a few. So we're going to pick on you guys. So the fluid intelligence. How does that, you can, even, you can take the side of it is helpful for st uh, strategic thinking, or you can say how maybe it's hurt you in being able to think strategically. Putting you on the spot, I know. Yeah, one of the other things that I'm seeing, though, is the not so much fear. So the older we get, at least for me, I was a lot more fearless when I was younger, didn't have a family, didn't have to uh, have people rely on me. And so I'm going to stick to the things that I know work. When we're a little bit younger, that fluid intelligence, let's try things that go get them spirit type, that can help us evolve in that, in that manner. Okay. Ah, so we're going to test you. How many people actually got the answer right in the previous, previous one? You knew the light bulb situation? Okay. Well, here's one. This is actually going to tell you how old your brain is. Great way to head into the weekend, I know. All right. Are we ready? Easy enough. You got this. You got this. But don't forget to count you and your friends inside the house as you keep track. Got it? Ready? Go. Whoa, looks like a pretty rocking party. You still keep track as people start to leave. I heard four people say four out of 100 people. How many people legitimately got it right? The number of people in the thing. How many people just gave up? 
Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So for those that just gave up, at least we gave you a little tip for those senior moments. And I will tell you, I've been having more senior moments lately, and, and it works. I mean, I'll walk into a room and go, why did I come in this room? And move that left. And I'll eventually remember. It may take, you know, 30, 40 minutes, but I will figure it out <laughs> at some point. Okay, so regardless of whether we pass that test or not, depending on what generation we're in, it doesn't matter. Um, there's things that we can do to become better at our strategic thinking. So there's some essential building blocks I want to share with you. The first is called cognitive reshaping. And basically, that means just retraining the brain through a lot of different mental exercises. In the very, uh, one of the very last slides, I've got a list of different apps that you can use to help stimulate your brain. Um, but there are some things that we can do that don't require going to an app store. And the first is called going to the balcony exercise. It was developed by William Urey in his negotiation book, Getting Past No. Anybody read that book? Okay. Cliff Notes version, all we care about is the going to the balcony exercise. So basically what that says is when we're stressed out, when there's a whole bunch of stuff going on and we haven't been able to think or get that soak time, it's taking that mental step out onto the balcony, trying to focus on what got us to this point, what was the goal or objective that we were trying to achieve, and trying to systematically work through those steps to reach, reach that goal. So going to the balcony exercise helps us with moving across levels of the, uh, abstraction. Now another one that I use quite a bit, my wife and I have a handful of rent homes in town and the exercise is called the architects exercise and basically what you do is when you first walk into a new home or a new business is mentally take stock of what it would take to make that a better place to work or a better place to live so as you can imagine it's a competitive market especially in Tulsa you gotta buy the houses pretty quickly and so when I hear of one that I think is good I've gotta walk in and I've gotta quickly assess man I've gotta knock out a wall I've gotta add uh, something in the kitchen I gotta paint and this is what it's gonna cost it's worth this much to do a bid it's that visioning exercise that is allowing us to, to be able to do that. So my wife does challenge me, though, and says, don't, uh, you shouldn't go do that when we go over to new friends' homes and quickly tell them what they should do to make their house a better place. Um, another one is the article and case-based studying. Now, this doesn't sound glamorous, but it does work. And I think it's very appropriate for us as PMs, especially with this movement towards agile, um, I know that Linda shared a few articles this week, and Lee Lambert, uh, anybody know Lee Lambert, one of the founding members of the PMP? Uh, he released an article this week that said the, um, the traditional project management is on its deathbed. And so even with the Pinbox 6 that's coming out, they've now uh, also included the Agile uh, Practitioner's Guide. So there is a movement towards more of an Agile type of project management. But how this works from a strategic thinking ability is go out to like HBR, Harvard Business Review, go grab articles off of your network uh, or wherever you're going, LinkedIn, and share that with the folks in your PMO or folks within your department. Give them the head of time. It's like an Oprah Winfrey Book of the Month Club type of thing. Have them get some time to read through it and then start talking about it and work through those. You don't have to take a position because you're not having to defend your turf. You're working through an idea. And so giving you uh, that ability to kind of contextualize and frame a discussion can help with uh, strategic thinking. And conduct simulations. I'm a big movie guy. I can't say this was my favorite movie. Anybody seen Nicolas Cage's Next? One guy. All right. It's not a great movie. So that one I'm not recommending. So it's one big simulation in the sense that Nicolas Cage is able to see how many ever days, weeks, hours, minutes into the future, and then he gets killed numerous times and he just rewinds and is able to go back and take the other path. We're not uh, condoning that, uh, but what simulations allow us to do, especially if we're trying to figure out what we want to do with our company, with our department, is run through and set up manageably complex environments that allows us to kind of do what if analysis and do some scenario based things. And if we reach an endpoint, oh, this is, this is a pop culture reference. Uh, choose your own adventures. Any Gen Xers out there? Choose your own adventures and turn. Yeah, those are awesome. So this allows us to, hey, we get there and something doesn't work. We can rewind and we can try again, which is far less costly than trying a plan in the real world and it fails and we become bankrupt. So create simulations, create um, some of those strategies and those scenarios that you can work with uh, other folks on to kind of develop some of those skills. And the last one, pretty easy, find a mentor. Uh, it doesn't have to be in your area of focus. In fact, it's sometimes better to get a different perspective. Find somebody in your church, uh, in sports, in 
your friends, that you just really admire the way that they think and how they're always able to stay one step ahead and align yourself with them, with, them, uh, with those folks. Take them to lunch, pick their brains. So becoming kind of an apprentice to those individuals. So finding somebody like that can help you become a better strategic thinker. Now, those are things that you can do on an ad hoc basis, but what can we do day in and day out? Because strategic thinking is supposed to be a daily occurrence. What we can do daily to become better at strategic thinking? Well, sometimes we have to uh, pull our heads out or sometimes uh, up to make sure that we're seeing that information that's going to be beneficial to us. How we do that is joining groups like this, and this is a great turnout. Pick these people's brains, join different communities on LinkedIn, find a good solid network both social and professional so you can keep your finger on the pulse of the industry that you're working in or wish to get into. Now asking the tough questions, if we follow conventional wisdom, we'll avoid the naysayers and the head shakers, but we lose competitive advantage when we just go with the flow. We need to be able to ask questions. It's okay to be curious. We need to either play devil's advocate or seek out others to play devil's advocate for us because it allows us to take a different perspective and we can look at different approaches to seek out opportunities and solutions to whatever it is that we're, we're looking for. Okay, so project managers, strategic thinkers, they should be asking questions all the time. We've got to do it professionally, of course, but we've got to ask questions and use tools like the five whys to get us down and solve root cause. We know as, as PMs or continuous improvement folks, solving the root cause issue is going to be far better than treating the symptoms on the periphery. And the third one, strategic thinkers, how they sound, how they write, their focus is to lead and get people to a solution, not tell people the solution. So it's framing your speech, framing your written word so that people can add their ideas and their concepts to it so that they see the light and not just tell them that the light is on. So these all sound easy enough, but why don't we do it then? What's keeping us from being able to do this on a regular basis? For some, it can be our own personal journey into the pit of misery. Dilly dilly. Dilly dilly. dilly. Okay? But for others, for those of you, there may only be a handful of you out there, but for those that are out there that say, man, I am not thinking strategically enough. Why? What's keeping you from thinking strategically? Not enough of it? Not enough time? Okay, what else? Distractions, what else? Stuck in a rut, okay. Yeah, we create that rut, we're in that hamster wheel, we're just going round and round, turning the crank. Being in a rut creates boredom and apathy. It creates, it's not my problem, I don't care, I'll do my eight hours and go home and get my paycheck. Okay. For some, it's living in a culture that's outdated. I've already heard it is what it is and that's the way it's always been done. Those are absolute obstacles to change and absolute obstacles and roadblocks to being able to think strategically. Yeah, Neeraj? So, come across this is pretty, pretty strange, but you can think strategic, but it is very difficult to implement a new strategic thinking uh, you know, text plan and so on. Yeah. So, Absolutely. You can't have the executive of the company send out a memo and say, tomorrow we will all be strategic thinkers. Doesn't happen. It, I have found it has to be a grassroots type of deal. It has to start from the bottom up. We have to find like minds, not the same minds, but like minds who will want to join that quest with us. And so, uh, truthfully, when I asked earlier, is it in your job description that you need to think strategically? I have not yet found anybody who says, we want our project managers, engineers, QA analysts, to be strategic thinkers. But if you ask a company or ask an HR rep, would you like your company to think strategically more often? They, I believe, would say yes. So why don't, do, why don't we do these things? So I challenge, anybody in HR here? Tim, yes. Tim, put them in your job descriptions. Got to see them. Okay, saying yes to too many things. This kind of leads into that multitasking. We want to please people inherently, most of us. We want to appear busy, we want to appear important, so we keep on taking more and more and more, which leaves absolutely no time to think strategically. Okay, there are two others that I want to spend just a little bit of time on, negative thinking and ineffective leadership. Okay, from a negative thinking perspective, there's two main culprits. The obsessive dwelling on past problems that didn't go our way. 
So for a brief moment, I want you to go to the dark side of negative thinking. I want you to think of a project failure that you had or a project stakeholder that was just unbearable to deal with. Okay? Now, do those ever creep back into your mind at some point and you go and you just start dwelling on it? It becomes that rut and you just start getting depressed about it. Got to break out of the negative thinking and as the, the quote says, if we can replace those with positive results, change the channel, change the mental picture in your head. Um, a more active approach is exercise. All right, so if we exercise, it releases endorphins. We've heard of runner's high. Okay, the endorphins are happy, are happy place. Okay, it creates and removes, it creates more happiness and removes the negative thoughts. Now, I would encourage you, yes, do exercise, but studies say you can't do an exercise that is very uh, singular and very repetitive, running on a treadmill, because you can easily slip back into those negative thoughts. You actually have to do something that stretches your brain and your body. Kind of multitasking while you exercise a little bit. Even running on the road and dodging traffic, that's a little bit better, kind of, <laughs> than running on a treadmill. Okay, the other one is holding on to grudges. All right, there's always been somebody that may have wronged us in the past, and man, if we see that person, I'm just going to tell them off. Can't do it. You don't need to be in the negative. That's all stuff in the past. So Ohio State University did a study and said, hey, if you guys will just write down your grudges, write it on a piece of paper, and then physically... Throw it away. It allows you to move on. Now, the ineffective leadership, when we talk about when Niraj said it's not easy to implement, if you have ineffective leadership, I would dare say it's going to be almost impossible to put strategic thinking in. So, uh, Management Research Group, MRG, did a study uh, end of last year, I believe, maybe 2016, uh, but they went and looked at 200,000 executives in 142 countries across uh, 26 different industries to try to find out what characteristics made up effective leaders. I mean, it was a great stat to find for this presentation, but they found strategic approach was 10 times more important to a leader's effectiveness than the other 21, 22 characteristics that they did this assessment on. Number two, which was still a distant number two, was communication which as PMs we know we should be communicating 90% of the time, but strategic approach, that visioning ability is what is going to make us effective. Unfortunately, ineffective leaders don't allow that to happen. They, they put themselves first. They think they are the smartest person in the room or feel that they must be the smartest person in the room. So they fill up the air with talking, just talking and not listening. The problem with that is they're missing substantial opportunities to pull back from their other leaders in the company, the other people in the company, and that could have helped them from a professional and personal development. Narcissism is not a replacement for strategic thinking. Ineffective leaders often surround themselves with yes men. We've heard that term, Kool-Aid drinkers, disciples, roadies, okay? But then the problem with that is if everybody is saying yes and following right along, then we, we start encountering what's called groupthink. We've heard that too, tr uh, term. So as General Patton said, if everybody's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. So again, we're missing out on the opportunities for new value, new ideas. We're pushing down the people that might have a good idea, but it's a dissenting opinion. We've been taught in the PMBOK, we've been taught in project management that conflict isn't bad the point of fisticuffs or shivs in the parking lot, that conflict is bad. But conflict just allows us to take a little bit of one person's idea and a little bit from somebody else's and elevate the whole situation. Unfortunately, ineffective leaders don't do that. It gets exacerbated by hiring the same type of people. And for my Star Trek folks out there, we soon start finding an assimilation to the Borg. Do I have any, the couple people that laughed know Star Trek. Okay. So by the same token of putting strategic thinking as a characteristic or a quality that we want in our hires, break the mold. Hire different people, get new views, new values, new ideas, or we'll end up like Sears. We'll end up like so many of these other companies that yes, we were doing well the way it was always done until it wasn't. So how do, how do those ineffective leaders get out of that rut, as somebody said, a circle of habit? 
How can we get out if we're finding ourselves with negative thoughts, negative feelings? Stretch our boundaries, get outside more, do something new. If you guys can recall a time where you tried to do something new and how it felt. And the story that I like to share with this is, I mentioned the PM for Youth program. I, I developed it for my daughter who at the time was in fifth grade trying to learn state capitals. And she said, Dad, why do I have to learn state capitals? I, look, I can look at Google. And I thought, well, that is true. Why do you need to know, know that stuff? At any rate, she is a freshman now in college. And so uh, after her eighth grade year, uh, we were asked to go speak in Salt Lake City. She and I, wow, that's cool. She, uh, she's got a little bit of a drama queen to her, so she was all on board about it until I told her it was an eight o'clock in the morning presentation. She wasn't <laughs> too excited about that. So after the presentation, you know, we did a great job. We're in Salt Lake City. We said, what do you want to do? And I thought she was going to say, let's go watch a movie. Let's go shopping. That's what I thought, you know, teenage girls did. And she said, Dad, isn't this where the Winter Olympics were? And I think it's appropriate. Winter Olympics kicked off yesterday. Uh, but Salt Lake City hosted the 2002 Winter Olympics. And so they had the only full-size bobsled track in the U.S. And you could go and do that. You could go do a bobsled. And so I'm sure the record will be set uh, or broken in this Olympics. But at the time, I think the record was 72 miles an hour. We only got to go 66 miles an hour in a bobsled going around the track. And it seemed like it was a three-minute uh, or ten-minute uh, ride. I think it was like a 45-second ride. And fortunately, I was in front of her, so she couldn't see my face. <laughs> and I thought, wow, we're dead. This was, this was a fun trip. But, but afterwards, we were able to take pictures next to the bobsled. We're high-fiving, and the endorphins, the excitement, the something new, the exhilaration of trying something new versus sitting in a theater or going to the mall was awesome. I'm not suggesting that you guys go to Salt Lake City and get on a bobsled track. But if you find yourself in a rut, do something different. It can be as simple as take a different way back to work today. Go to a different place to eat. Read a different type of book or go see a different movie or a musical or whatever it is. But try to do something different and make the conscious effort to repeat those new changes. And you'll soon find that you'll have a whole new look on life. You'll find that you'll uh, truly be able to live that variety is the spice of life. You'll be able to to enjoy it a little bit more. All right, so I want to wrap up with um, a case study, making a case study for strategic thinking. It's about an organization. I'm going to give you a couple of clues. Once you figure out who it is, I want you to yell out uh, what company you think it is. I'm going to tell you how they were able to implement strategic thinking to make a pretty uh, drastic turnaround. All right, just celebrated their 60th year of having a very important patent. Okay, I purposely don't give it away right out of the gate. Been named to Forbes list of most powerful brands the last three years. They're either number one or number two. It's been in the top three of the world's most respected company 10 years in a row. World's most respected. I heard Apple. Coca-Cola. Okay, those are two good guesses. Who? GE. Okay. All good guesses. Not the one I'm looking for. Who? IBM. Okay. Not yet. Maybe this should give it away. Became world's most valuable toy company in 2013 and hasn't relinquished that spot since. Anybody ever uh, seen or stepped on one of those Lego blocks? Yeah. Most respected my foot, literally stepping on it. Okay. So couple of things uh, to share about Lego. They, they weren't always this great. It's just happened recently. Take you all the way back to 1999. 1999. Highly dysfunctional management team. Now, they're based in Denmark, and it was a family-owned company, but there was so much infighting, they absolutely did not al allow or tolerate dissenters. So the only good ideas that came out at that time were management's ideas. Well, that makes it very difficult to create a focus or direction for the organization. They still were making money. They've been very successful, but it was the same. Let's do building blocks. Let's do building blocks and more building blocks. Because there was no value, no new innovation, no strategic thinking going on, there were big periods of time where there was very little innovation. Yes, they still released products. There weren't very many, and those that, that they did release failed 
for the most part. All the knowledge in the organization became tribal knowledge because nobody wanted to share. Nobody wanted to, to raise a concern or voice any new ideas. And so what happened is they had people, employees that were working there 30, 40, 50 years. And soon those people started to retire. And because there was no knowledge share, all that information left, which actually proved to be a good thing. Because at the turn of the century, 2000, somebody finally decided to bring in a new president from outside the toy company space. And the first thing that person did said, we're going to expand and hire people outside of Denmark. They would only hire people in Denmark. Denmark was a very costly place to work. Their economy is such that cost of living, etc., cetera, was, was out there. So they started to bring in new minds, some younger, some of different generations. But the president said, I'm not here to tell you what the new ideas are. You guys are smart people. You guys collaborate and come up with something new. I will provide direction and I'll steer the ship, but a ship's captain by himself does not get you to your destination. So what they ended up doing, the first thing was let's, let's collaborate, let's talk. And so one of the first things that came out was an online social uh, networking community. Anybody a Lego card carrying member and proud of it? Hold your hand up. Okay, I will, I will bear that for everybody. I am a Lego card carrying member. So, Online community, uh, let me ask this, the building block kits, you yourself or kids maybe put those together, yeah. So what they did in this online community is they said, you guys come up with ideas, general public, and we'll do a theme, maybe it's a pirate theme, and people, designers would submit their designs, and then after a month, the whole LEGO community would vote on it, and whichever one won, that's the one they would produce. And they gave the first one off the manufacturing line to the designer. But what did they just accomplish here? They created a customer base. They created R&D. They created marketing for nothing. It didn't cost any money. And it got people excited and the numbers grew exponentially. Okay, Blocks were great. And yeah, we expanded into kits, but they decided to head for blue ocean markets. Blue ocean markets say, hey, hit, swing for the fences, go for the home run, go into untapped markets. And so they did through different ways. They went uh, with a Steven Spielberg movie making kit where you could actually videotape your or I don't know if it's video record or whatever they were doing with the little figures this was years before the Lego movie which went went did very well um, Lego architecture I thought this was pretty cool so there was an architect in Chicago that designed and built he had to go up to several different stores and bought tens of thousands of Legos to be able to create the Sears Tower it was a 70-piece kit, and he took to a Lego Expo. But in addition to the kit itself, it had a bio on the architect. Um, it showed a history of it. It gave him some other information, and Lego said, this is a great idea. And they ended up being able to enter into a $200 billion space, which is museum collectibles and big market gift shops and bookstores. And they can actually sell this at a premium. 70-piece uh, kit for their architecture sells for $19.99. A 70-piece kit for a toy is $7.99. So they were able to understand that they're not the smartest guys in the room and use somebody else's ideas and leverage that and, and grow a business. Um, go back one. Lego board games happen by happenstance. One of the designers, they were kicking around an idea and the designer came home and with one of the designs and he found his two kids the next day playing it. And these kids had just received, what was really cool about this, the uh, a new video game, whatever the popular one at the time, they had the video game and he thought, hey, the kids are just gonna play the video game all weekend. He watched them play and they realized that Lego wasn't a solitary activity, it could actually be a group activity. And placing it as a game, adding competition, adding I am the winner, uh, older brother, I'm the winner, hold that over your head. They knew they had a hit on their hands. So instead of just launching that one game, they quickly were able to launch 10 different games in that same year. And then the last one, uh, Lep from Toys to Education. How many people, uh, Lego Robotics, know anybody or have anybody? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, you are, yeah. It's huge, huge thing. And so they started uh, to align themselves with the STEM program, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. The Lego Robotics and the first Lego League, first Lego League started in, in 1999, there were 1,600 students. 
My son competed in the state tournament last year. There were over 20,000 teams and 150,000 participants. And it's not just for fun. It, there is, and, and Dan can tell you everything, we only have six minutes, but it's, cool, it's a cool concept. And it allows people to start, the kids, to start learning these skills that are far more useful than learning state capital. So I too am, uh, am looking to align uh, PM for Youth with the, the LEGO programs. Another thing that they did was made key strategic partnerships. Realize what you're good at, realize what you're not good at, and seek out those that can supplement or aid or complement what you offer. So one of the things that they did was merge with Merlin Entertainment. Anybody ever been to Legoland? There's several Legolands out there. Okay. 1999, they had Legoland. It was losing them money. Lego was not a good company to run amusement parks. Merlin Entertainment is. They're, they're world, worldwide. So what Lego did was they partnered with Merlin. Merlin runs all the Lego lands now, but Lego still owns the name and the trademark, and so they get the residuals off of that. The other partnership was with Warner Brothers, and this proved to be very important uh, for their success. Um, anybody ever played the Lego uh, video games, whether it's Batman or Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? So Warner Brothers owned all those titles, and all Lego had to do, it was a very... Uh, wash, rinse, and repeat type of cycle. They had the storyline already built. They didn't have to build it. They just created the games and partnered with them to launch not, uh, not only something that the kids would play, but the adults would play with the kids. So it expanded their market. So my personal kind of story that I have with, with Lego and strategic thinking, uh, several summers ago now, I didn't want my son playing all of the Lego video games. So I said, if you do something on a daily basis that will stimulate your brain and your body. I'll put a dollar into the, into the pool. At the end of the summer, we'll see how much money we have and we'll buy a Lego kit. We would build Lego kits together. So at the end of the summer, we were able to uh, have enough money to buy the Millennium Falcon. Anybody seen that? Which is, which is pretty, pretty cool. That's me and my bro uh, having built the Millennium Falcon. And so at the end of the summer, he said, Dad, all we have to do now, we have to get the Death Star. Now, if anybody knows, the Death Star, largest, at least at the time, the largest kit, or the largest Star Wars kit, um, cost over $400. So I said, hey, buddy, I don't think, there's, don't think there's enough mind and body exercises we can do to get the Death Star. He goes, Dad, I got it figured out. We're just going to ask Santa Claus. <laughs> strategic thinker in the making. So I, then I knew I got to reward the strategic thinker there's me and my bro with the Death Star after that Christmas. So, I told you that uh, there's some things that we can do from an app perspective. I have uh, the presentation that I'm going to give uh, to Linda, but if you want to take a picture of this as well, I would highly encourage you to do that. This is part of that cognitive reshaping we talked about. There's a lot of things that we can do to become better strategic thinkers, but as we say, the longest journey begins with the first step. And so I challenge and encourage you to begin that journey because it's going to be important for you for your personal development, for your professional development. As Niraj alluded to, your boss isn't going to necessarily tell you to do it and it's going to happen overnight. You've got to align yourself with folks that will make this a success for you. So I appreciate your time today. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much.